Hello everybody and welcome to Dot to Dot. Today I'm going to talk about the secret mystery of Oak Island, the original secret mystery of Oak Island, and this is the 90-foot stone. Now I know a lot of you are going, oh boy, the 90-foot stone. This is something that is very much the start of the Oak Island mystery. And actually without the 90-foot stone, how could we possibly know that there was anything on Oak Island? Now, many critics say that it's just a myth. And really, they're basically saying that the Oak Island mystery is a myth. But I got some information, new information that you may have not heard before. And it is something that basically I take another perspective, the pro 90-foot stone perspective and give you a little bit of a more of a concrete foundation on why the 90 foot stone was real and that there is something on Oak Island. So let's start off, and I have a presentation here for you today. And, you know, everybody knows that the 90 foot stone uh, is basically where they get the Kempton cipher. And we'll get into Kempton a little later in this series. But uh, the Kempton cipher is what the 90-foot stone revealed. And up here, this is not the 90-foot stone. This is a just a replication of what was given to Kempton and what was revealed uh, in uh, Kempton's notes that were uh, later revealed in 1949 through a book by Edward Snow. Uh, we'll get into that later. But one thing I got to tell you is uh, a lot of the things about the 90 foot stone have come after it. And one of the things that has come after it is La Formula. Now, La Formula uses the Kempton cipher, letter for letter, symbol by symbol. And the Kempton cipher is also used in the Phil Philip Stevenson. Uh, document that was revealed on uh, the Curse of Oak Island, I believe last season, not season nine, season eight. And this also uses the Kempton cipher. And the thing about these is the, the La Formula actually has four more symbols that are included into La Formula that were not in the 90 foot stone. And the same with the uh, Philip Stevenson document. And the Philip Stevens document even has more uh, information than La Formula and the 90 foot stone, where it has the minus 21 degrees and the 145 degree distance. And these are La Formula and the Philip Stevenson document are both translated into French. Another thing that's in common to all these are the depth of 40 feet. 40 feet below, 2 million pounds are buried, is what the 90-foot stone says. The formula says, stop, do not dig, at 40 feet, at 40 feet. And the uh, Philip Stevenson document says, dig 40 feet and the and the feet in the two the formula in the philip stevenson document is actually pied which is a pre-1668 french uh unit of measure for a foot so my question is and 40 feet is very um important in all these documents and 40 feet is what was translated by Kempton in, or revealed to us by Kempton in 1949. And it really wasn't revealed by Kempton. It was revealed by the author Edward Snow in his book. So Kempton really didn't bring this forth to the public. He just gave the information to an author. But prior to that, the translation was shown in the 
story of Oak Island published in 1895, which I believe was part of the prospectus for the Oak Island Treasure Company. And it read, 10 feet below. Now this translation, 10 feet below, also appeared in a book in 1911 by an author called Payne, P-A-I-N-E. And where he got that information, most likely from the Oak Island story and the perspective. So where did that translation come from? So these are things that we're going to look into in this series, and we're going to uh, try and un unravel how these translations came to light. And was the 90-foot stone real? And one of the things that we can, um, is the critics, okay? And I'm going to give you the critical points first. First, the cr critics say there's no physical evidence of the 90-foot stone. And that is true. There isn't. And they ask the questions, why wasn't there any rubbings taken? Why isn't there any rip written copies? Well, actually, there probably was, and we'll show that later. But why weren't there any photos? Well, photogra photography was very early stages in those days, so that might be possible. But, you know, the main thing that most critics don't realize is the context of what we're talking about. These are treasure hunters. These are treasure hunters. And what treasure hunters give up their information? I know of the treasure hunters that we know, like Dan Blankenship and Tom Noland and, you know, not the guys of Oak Island. They seem to tell us everything, but they kept their secrets closely guarded. And some of the secrets have gone to the grave with them. So why would they show the 90-foot stone to the public? Well, one of the reasons they say is because it was the reason for the stone was to sell shares, that they were using the stone to sell shares for their endeavors on Oak Island. Uh, they also say that wit there's no the witnesses say there was no inscription on the stone. Yes, there were two witnesses, Marshall and Colonel um, Bowen, who said that there was no inscription on the stone. And we're going to give you a context and an explanation for that. Why wasn't any authority notified? In other words, the critics will say this was a big discovery. This was something, you know, of archaeological importance. And why wasn't anybody from the Smithsonian, you know, called in to check this out and everything like that? Again, these are treasure hunters. And another thing is, too, the Oak Island mystery back in those days, if you read the articles in the newspapers of that time, which is about the 1860s, these guys were sort of ridiculed for what they were doing. They were made fun of in a lot of the newspaper articles. They're basically thought of as fools. And in some authors who wrote books said that they were basically immoral, uh, you know, uh, money grubbing, uh, you know, not very good people because of what they were doing, because they believed that the treasure was of Captain Kidd or of pirates and that ill-gotten gains are still ill-gotten gains. Another one of the critics' uh, points is that all the witnesses' accounts of the inscription is hearsay. And yes, this is true. You know, there are, um, you know, the, the accounts that we're going to look at are from, you know, somebody saying that this person said that. There's one witness account from George Cook, that is an actual first-hand account, but it's written in a newspaper. It's written in a letter, actually. Um, and, you know, it, we don't have anybody alive to tell us, you know, or show us. And the other uh, critical point is that the story about the cipher being worn off is convenient and most likely improbable. In other words... The 90-foot stone that was supposedly in a bookstore 
for a long time called Creighton's Bookstore, and they went there on the Curse of Oak Island and supposedly found that stone. And they say that, you know, it, it wasn't ever, uh, a, if there was an inscription on it, uh, it's just very convenient that there isn't one now. And there are a lot of variations in the description and the accounts that revolve around the 90-foot stone. So, you know, one of the things that I see in the basic evidence is we have these Kempton cipher. Now, if the 90-foot stone is not real, then the formula cannot be possibly real. And the Philip Stevenson would actually not be real. So, if you look at this, this is La Formula, and this right here is the exact shape of what we call the Antiara schematic. Both of these are presented by, um, or were found and discovered by a person named Bill Jackson. The, this piece right here, which is the same shape as La Formula, is part of what we call the Antiara schematic, and you can see it right here in the middle. And this is a schematic showing all the tunnels. Here's the oak, uh, the oak entrance or the, the money pit. And this is a schematic showing the underground tunnel system and the vault. That's just why Olivier and I call it the vault theory. And it also shows the valve and the trap door and the hole under the trap door. And so this is connected to La Formula and La Formula is connected to the 90 foot stone. And the, the map, the Rochefoucauld map says the hole under the trap door and the valve on this map. So this is connected, this map is connected to this, which shows the valve, the hole under the trap door. So there's no real physical 90 foot stone. I understand that. But there is a context of hiding it and hiding what was found. And I think what we're dealing with is this. Let's look at this first. The Lunenburg County, this is the, the document of the history of Lunenburg County. And they describe this as a flagstone, two feet long, one foot wide, with rudely cut letters that could not be deciphered. And this is the only account that says that the engraved side was, was downwards. And this was written by an anonymous person. They don't know who wrote this up, but uh, he said that he had worked at Oak Island for 15 years. This is a newspaper article that has a quote from a man named Jotham. Macaulay, and he was very integral in the Oak Island excavations in the mid-1800s. And he describes it as a stone cut square, two feet long, and about one foot thick. Now, whether he meant wide or thick, I don't know. But this is a description, and this is what we're looking at. Okay, let's get into the Creighton Bookstore. Now, the Creighton Bookstore is the place where the 90-foot stone supposedly was kept. And this is a statement by Edward Marshall, who uh, wrote to Frederick Blair telling about the 90-foot stone. Frederick Blair was the man who started the Oak Island Treasure Company in 1893. He actually was affiliated with Oak Island since he was 17 years old and kept uh, uh, attempts at the money pit 
until uh, the 1940. So he was very much involved. He owned the lease on Oak Island for the area of the money pit from 1900 to 1940. So for 40 years, he spent, he spent a lot of time. But this is what Edward Marshall said. He said that the stone was two feet long, 15 inches wide, and about 10 inches thick. So this is a pretty big stone. And this is, looks pretty much like the stone that they found on the Curse of Oak Island. I can't remember what season it was, but I find this interesting. The tradition said that it had been part of two fireplaces. They say that the corners were not squared. And here's the big thing that I think is very interesting in this is the initials JM. I think JM is Jahem McCulley. Now, they, some accounts say that it was a child, some child uh, chiseled them in. But I'm going to show you, it's pretty hard. This, this stone was not easily marked. Now, Bode, uh, Bode, Bodine, Colonel Bodine, he was with the Oak Island Salvage Company in 1909. This is the one that had uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in it. Or uh, was it Franklin Delano? Yes. So uh, he said that there was no visible cipher and that the stone was too hard to been worn away. In other words, the account was that that the the Creighton used the stone as to beat on it, beat books on it, and it, the inscription was worn away because he was beating on it. And uh, I find this story very hard to believe why Creighton would use the ninety foot stone to beat on it, especially uh, when it wasn't even found, the cipher translation wasn't even found until 1895. So, hence, this is what uh, Bodin says, hence, there was never any inscription, and he leaves the Oak Island calling it a fraud. And this is the article in which he said that. So, this is the stone that is at Creighton's bookstore. This is the the description of its uh, geology and it is a hard granite and these these uh, rocks they do turn green when they've been exposed and uh, it's denser than most granite so the, the fact that this stone at Creighton's bookstore had uh, markings worn away is very improbable. And I agree with Colonel Bodin that there was never any inscription on that stone. Never any inscription on the stone in the store. So here's an interesting letter. This letter was sent to Jahan McCauley. Now I'm going to show you a little bit about Jahan McCauley in a minute. Jotham and it, the, it's from this man named Captain Thompson. <clears throat> and it says, I've seen Mr. Creighton and he got a telegram out. He got the telegram all right. I was speaking to him about some shares and he said, I should have applied to you. Can you let me have five shares? If so, please make out the papers as soon as you can. And I'll be ready with the money. I will consider it as a favor if you will do this for me. So this guy really wants in. About the other affair, this is where it gets interesting. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about this telegram that Mr. Creighton got? I suppose you have written to Boston. I was thinking if I had the address, I could write to her and send a piece of the stone and we could compare the answers received and if favorable, I could engage four laborers in Halifax, bring them down and meet you and the others, that is Fraser and Ross, at the place and go to work. Please write by return post and tell me what you think of it. So this is uh, 1863, he writes this. The uh, Oak Island 
the Oak Island Treasure Company uh, was basically broke. They had gone, they run out of money in 1862. And I know they wanted to raise a little bit more money. And this Captain Thompson in August of 1863, he wants in. And so... He's asking for a piece of the stone, but he says, could we compare the answers? Now, some people have uh, put forth the theory that there was a woman in Boston who uh, had some uh, history in translating ciphers and, and runes and stuff like that. I couldn't find much information about that, but the thing I want to take away from this is he went to Creighton's store to get some shares. And Creighton says, you should have applied to Jotham McCauley. So what is, the, we find out that, that Mr. Creighton, Creighton's store was a place you went to to inquire about Oak Island shares. Why? Because Mr. Creighton was always, probably always there. You couldn't always find Jotham McCauley, Jotham McCauley, but you could find Mr. Creighton, and he would point you in the direction of Jotham McCauley. So if we have a stone in his window, why? Why do we have, how is this going to help the Oak Island Treasure Company in buying shares if somebody's inquiring about Oak Island and they come to see the stone and there's no inscription on it, they're going to get the same impression as Colonel Bodine. This is just a bunch of hogwash. But the fact that there is Jahan McCauley's initials in the corner basically tells you that this is how they went about it. So, Jotham McCulley, he was born 14 years after the stone was discovered. And he was involved in all these, uh, the Truro Company, the Oak Island Association, which is the main one that did a lot of work on the island. And uh, also the Halifax Company, which we know very little about. Now, Jotham McCulley, he died in 1899 at the age of 80. The first translation that we know of of the 90-foot stone came out in 1895. So he would have still been alive. He still would have been alive uh, during uh, the time of uh, the later, the later uh, excavations at Oak Island. And these excavations were done by people that were not really locals. And that's the other thing is Jotham McCulley and the Truro Company and the Halifax Company and the Oak Island Association, these were all very local people. And I don't think they really had a big uh, aspiration to allow outside people come in, especially people uh, that, you know, may find it. So this is the Truro Company, and I'm just showing, here's Robert Creelman, who's actually uh, my first cousin, five times removed, and uh, the original uh, Dr. Simons, he was uh, the first guy that they contacted as an investor. Um and so these are all the companies that Jotham McCauley was um, working with. Now, this is the Oak Island Contract Company. No work was done on the island. And this is the first year that the 90-foot stone was removed from the fireplace of John Smith's Oak Island house and put in the window of the bookbinder, Creighton, uh, Marshall and Creighton in Halifax. So this is the first year that they had the stone there and they did not sell any shares. So 
it was uh, the Halifax Company, which is in 1866, uh, finally got some shares up. But it's very hard for me to believe that the stone in the Creighton bookstore was used to sell shares to the uh, to the Oak Island Treasure Company or Oak Island Association. So we find that, you know, there were not a lot of people told about this. There were some people, there's accounts that say that some, a lot of people saw the stone. A lot of people saw this. I don't, there's no real proof of that. But one of the things is McCulley was interviewed and this is a, an author uh, and he wrote the rambles of the uh, among the blue noses, which is a very derogatory comment uh, about people of Nova Scotia. And he wrote this in 1862, so it's about the time period. And Macaulay does not mention the stone to this man. And I don't believe that he really mentioned it to many people and many people were trying to get a hold of him. Uh, a lot of authors, uh, after this author in 1862, a lot of authors and newspaper people were after them for a story. So one of the big things that comes about here is, and this goes into the point against the authority figures were never uh, contacted. And this is a letter from John Duvar, who was the secretary of the Historical Society of Nova Scotia. So it's not Smithsonian, but it's something, it's an authority of history, okay? And he writes this to George Cook. And the, I'll give you the little backstory on this is George Cook accidentally gave a uh, testimony or report to a newspaper and he left his he left himself anonymous with the newspaper reporter, and ap apparently he mentions the ninety foot stone to this reporter, and it's written up in the newspaper. Now Hunter Devar finds out that George Cook is the person who the reporter spoke to, and he sends him a letter, and this is in eight January of eighteen sixty four. Remember this date. May I beg? In the name of the society, to be informed with the name of the person and whose possession this stone is. So this guy, Hunter DeVar, is very much wanting to find out where this stone is. And he knows that George Cook knows where it is. Now, I don't know where the article is that was the anonymous article for George Cook, but that's the way the story goes. So, George Cook writes him back. And he says, on my return, I found your letter of the second instance. So this guy writes him two times, desiring information respecting the flagstone. Remember, this is now described as a flagstone, different from a big granite rock, bearing an inscription out of the old pit on Oak Island, awaiting me. The stone in question was saved by Mr. Smith. Now he's going to tell you about what he knows about it. And he's telling this guy from the, uh, you know, from the historical society. The stone in question was saved by Mr. Smith, who owned the place about 40 years ago. So this would be what? 1824. At the time when nothing was doing at, on the island. And when prospects of the treasure seekers appeared to be altogether hopeless. So you get the picture here. Smith's got this 90-foot stone, but it's not really any use to him. Mr. Smith built what was now called his, which went then was called his new house. In building it, he found that this interesting stone would suit admirably at the corner of the back of his chimney. And now this is important. And as he began to consider it of no value to himself or any other, anyone else, Here's the reason. On account of the operations at the island having ceased, he unfortunately put it into his chimney flat side out. In other words, with the inscription outwards. 
14 years ago, Mr. Smith pointed out the stone. So he's showing this to George Smith. This is 14 years ago. So that would be, what, 1850. And then I believe, I believe it was still in the chimney. So, you know, it was a long time ago. He doesn't really remember that. And he assured me that it was the identical stone out of the pit on the island in his presence. Mr. Smith has since died and the property passed in other hands. Mr. Grave owns the property and the building. And it is occupied at by the present Oak Island Association. So John Smith's house is being used by the Oak Island Association. Okay, he knows the stone's there. You don't think that these guys don't know that the stone is there? So this is where it's at. And I'm not aware whether Mr. Graves knows that it's in the chimney. So Mr. Graves, he doesn't know if Mr. But this is important. On making a query, inquiry since receipt of your letter. In other words, after he gets this letter from Devar, he goes out and starts talking to probably Johan McCulley or whoever of the Oak Island Association because George Cook isn't really part of it. I think he's a neighbor of uh, one of the guys of the associations, but um, he makes an inquiry. So he's asking people about it. And I find that the chimney has been boxed around and by a wood partition and that a flight of stairs goes up where the stone is inserted. So there's this partition, wood partition. When it was built, we don't know. But it's boxed around, so you can't see the 90-foot stone anymore. And he says, I was not aware of this before. This may prevent the stone from being got at without trouble and perhaps expense. But as it is very important for the interests of the Oak Island Association, if for no other object or reason, that the inscription on the stone be deciphered, this is why the 90-foot stone is not revealed to the public ever. They will not reveal it to the public. Whatever is in Creighton's bookstore is a decoy. It's a fake. It's something that when people find out about the 90-foot stone being in this store window, they go see it. When they go look at it, Creighton knows they're interested and he can approach them. But the 90-foot stone was never displayed in public. And I'll show you later. Okay, its position in the chimney ought not to be insuperable barrier to attempt to decipher being made. At the time I saw the stone, I noticed that there were some rudely cut letters, figures, and characters upon it. I cannot relect which, but they appear as if they had been scraped out by a blunt instrument rather than a cut sharp one. In other words, blunt instrument. You can't cut into granite, hard granite, with a blunt instrument. You maybe can make some scratches on there, but you can't cut them out. But that's you know neither here nor there. But w it will be, I think, uh, a point later. So and you know he says you know I'm I'm going to be your obedient service. You know you want to see this. It sounds like he's going to show it to him, and we're going to find out later that there's another. Um, testimony that is not as direct as this one. It's sort of a hearsay testimony that shows that they actually take down this partition, wood partition, to show somebody. Now, we don't know who they show it to, but notice also the date, 1864, okay? Note that date. Okay, here's the account, and this is written in the book of R.V. Harris, who wrote a lot of these books, or, or did a lot of research, very historical research. Um, he's a very skeptical person of the 90-foot stone, because he's going by the account that the 90-foot stone was in Creighton's bookstore. But here's the Oak Island Mystery, and this is written in 1958. And this account, okay, is about the partition, about... Uh, 
and also where the 90 foot stone went. This uh, testimony right here, or this art, this part in R. V. Harris's book, is uh, all over the place. So this is not a disputed um, uh, testimony here. About 1865 to 1866, the stone was removed and taken to Halifax. Among those who worked to remove the stone was Jefferson W. MacDonald. And then there was a letter, and this is probably where he got it from, but uh, a letter to Frederick Blair, who was later the Oak Island Tre Treasure Company in 1893, he said Jeffrey, uh, he knew Jefferson McDonald. He was actually on the crew with Frederick Blair, Jefferson McDonald, who was first mentioned to Oak Island to me in 1893, worked under George Mitchell, Mr. McDonald, who was a carpenter by trade, also told, told uh, Blair about taking down the petition at Smith's house in order that he, with others, might examine the characters cut on the stone used in the jam of the fireplace in the house. The characters were there all right, but no person present could decipher them. That's a quote from Jefferson MacDonald. So in 1893, okay, uh, it was told to uh, Frederick Blair that McDonald went to the house to take down the partition. Now, was this for the gentleman we had mentioned before? What was it? Um, Duvar Hunter? Was Duvar Hunter the one that they took it down? This is 1864. So uh, it was well before, you know, the testimony of, Jefferson McDonald. So Jefferson McDonald may have taken it down. And we know that in 1865, that the uh, stone was taken to Halifax. So the Oak Island Treasure Company, uh, by or the Oak Island Treasure by Charles Driscoll, this is a late uh, book written in 1929. And it describes the stone as thin, flat stone, three feet long and 16 inches wide. Now, I found out that after the translation in 1895 is revealed, it's always described as a flat stone, not necessarily thin, but a flat stone, three feet long, 16 inches wide. I believe this is the actual description of the 90-foot stone. So the testimony here is the stone was shown to everyone who visited the island that day. Let's talk about John Smith, who built the stone into his fireplace with the strange characters outermost so that the visitors might see and admire it. So he's saying that a lot of people went out to John Smith's house and they saw the stone. Many years after his death, the stone was removed from the fireplace and taken to Halifax, where local savants were unable to translate the inscription. It was then taken to the home of J.B. McCulley in Truro, where it was exhibited to hundreds of friends of the McCulleys who became interested in the treasure later. Now, he also goes on to say, and he says it's sort of perplexing. He, and I don't have it here, but it says, Driscoll says that it then, for some reason, ends up in the bookstore window in Halifax, where it was used to beat book bindings and the inscription was worn away. Why would they do that? That's his 1865. The translation didn't come out till 1895, 30 years after. Why would they beat on it if they didn't know what the, dis the translation said? It's the most important thing in the money pit. 
and they're not using it to sell shares because they don't have anything. So anyway, this is another, this is, uh, and we'll get into him later for the translation, but this is James DeMille. He was one of the professors at um, uh, Dalhousie College, which was also the, the college that uh, uh, Professor Lecti, who is basically the supposed translator of the 90-foot stone, also worked. But James DeMille was very much into Oak Island, hugely into Oak Island. He spent a summer there after the 90-foot stone had been removed in 1866. But I believe he saw it. He saw. And he wrote a book, Treasures of the Sea. And this is a book. Uh, it's basically historical fiction. And he's writing in the, uh, the first person of like a sea captain that's taking his sailors around to find treasure. And, uh, but we know that he uses some things that are factual in his writing. And this is very interesting. This is an excerpt from his book. They went to work and dug away for a little distance. When they came to something hard, it was a stone hewn, not very smooth, a kind of sandstone. And on this, they saw some marks that looked like strange letters. They were ignorant men, but they knew the alphabet. And they knew that this was no kind of English letters at all. But it seemed to them that they might be letters of some strange alphabet. They took this stone away, and it's been preserved ever since. And it's there yet on the island, built into the wall of a cottage there for safekeeping. And this is a part that some people that have done research leave out. And I don't know why. But he says... And of course, this is historical fiction, remember. I've seen it dozens of times. I've seen it myself dozens of times. So this James DeMille worked at Dalhousie College, and he came into the college the same year as Dr. Lecti, or uh, Professor Lecti, who was the person who supposedly translated the 90-foot stone. So you don't think if it went to that, to Halifax, to Housey College, that it wouldn't have been seen by him? No way. He would have seen it. And, of course, they get into the Captain Kid thing, and this is part of the story. So, you know, they, they all thought it was a Captain Kid treasure at that time. So, notice this is the description of a flagstone, much different than the, the kind of geology that we talked about with the stone that is in the store window of Creighton's bookbinding shop. One of the things, too, is I found this article, and this is uh, one of the beautiful kinds of research that is done by uh, D.R.C. O'Connor, who's a great researcher, by the way. If you don't know him, you should check him out on the, on the web. But this is the Oak Island Association, and this is an article. Uh, there was a meeting of the association, and where was it? Where did they meet at? At Dalhousie College. And it talks about J.B. McCauley, and it talks about how they're basically uh, have a lot of debt. So anyway, this is 1863. So this is before the 90-foot stone goes out of um, the uh, Tom uh, John Smith's house. So now remember, we had this uh, 1864. We had the uh, where George Cook talks to uh, John DeVar of the Historical Society and writes him that big letter. Yeah, let me show you where the stone is. This right here is taken from the Nova Scotia archives and jo uh, Jotham McCulley, okay, wrote up a copy of an oath. He wrote up an oath to be sworn at the meetings. Now, I couldn't get a 
picture or anything of this oath that's supposed to be sworn at the meetings of the Oak Island Association. But could it be, and this is just speculation, of course, could it be that since George Cook told Duvar about the stone, he said, you know, we got to have an oath here. You guys can't be spurting off your mouth about the stone. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have the dimensional change of the 90 foot stone. It was a flat stone, three feet long, 16 inches wide. And this was in the prospectus. It does, you know, there's some people that say that the prospectus has the translation of the 90 foot stone in it. That's not true. It's not in the prospectus. Now, the copy of the prospectus is copyrighted. I'm not going to show it to you, but it is on the web. And, uh, but the source of the translation, and it also has this description of the stone, same description, was a book. I think it was a book. It may have been part of the perspective called The Oak Island Story, published in Boston in 1895. So, it may have been part of the prospectus, but when you look at the actual prospectus, it does not give the translation to the 90-foot stone on it. It's in that book. It's in the book, The Story of Oak Island. So my conclusions are, there's two stones. The first stone was the Creighton stone. It was two feet long, 15 inches wide, and 10 inches thick. It was green, hardish, granite stone with round corners. It had JM carved into the initials to stand for Jotham McCulley, who you're supposed to see for acquiring shares. It was not in the inscribed stone. It may have been part of a fireplace. Hence the tradition, it was part of two fireplaces. Why would, why would they place a stone with no inscription and to entice investors? What, what sense does that make? I don't understand that. That's, it's lunacy even think that that was the 90 foot stone it goes against everything it shows them to be a fraud just like colonel Bo Bo uh, bodin said you know there's no inscription on this stone and there never was this is a hoax and they went packing and that's what the guys wanted the local guys but they wanted to lure and vet people interested through the inquiry to creighton who always would be at his store. He would refer them to McCulley, who had the stone, and satisfy them by showing it to him. Remember, McCulley had the stone. There's testimony that it went to Halifax. It may have not even went to Halifax. They may have just taken a copy, piece of paper or something, but it went to McCulley's house where he showed people that were actually who they wanted to be interested in the company. I don't think they just let anybody in. It was a local thing. I'm telling you, I know this. It still goes on today. And it was kept secure for 60 years. Why would they risk the real stone to be stolen behind a store window or beaten down to, why would they even beat on it? And they hadn't even deciphered it yet. It's, it's not in context. It does not meet the thing. So the flat squared corners, this is the real 90 foot stone. It was three feet long, 16 inches wide. It was rough sandstone or flagstone. It was built into John Smith's fireplace side for side out for safekeeping from 1805 until 1865. So basically 60 years. John Smith dies in 1857 and a wood partition is built around it at some point. We don't know if it was built by John Smith or after John Smith. We don't know. Smith's house in Oak Island is the headquarters of the Oak Island Association. And the stone was, the accounts say the stone was moved in 1865 or 1866. It was moved to Halifax possibly at Dalhousie University for study by James DeMille and James Lechte. 
most likely because they were, James DeMille was totally into Oak Island, completely. And then it was moved to Jaheim McCauley's house for safekeeping and privilege viewing. So this is what I have so far. I'm going to stop here because I have much, much more, and this has gone on too long. But in my next video, I'm going to talk about the translation and the translators. So thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. And we got much more to come. I'm talking to Olivier this afternoon, and he's been researching the same thing. We're going to be back on. It just takes time. And if you want to donate to this channel, there's also a little donation button down there. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.